Good afternoon, just everybody on this very hot day in Cannes. It's lovely to see you all. Um, and thanks for joining us for this session. Um, apologies in advance for my slightly croaky voice. You put a Brit near an air con conditioning unit and it doesn't <laughs> go well, so um, I'll apologize for that. Um, if you haven't been to Journal House before, um, you're very welcome. If you're a return visitor after our two-year hiatus, you're very welcome back. This is obviously the nicest place to be in the whole of Cannes. Um, and I think what's been evident um, over the years in Cannes, and certainly in the years since we've been away, is a lot has sure. changed. There's been a huge acceleration towards tech. Um, and in the creativity space especially, that conversation now goes hand in hand with where, well, where are we in tech? How are we using AI? What are we doing in a cookie-less world, et cetera? Um, and so to that end, I'm delighted that we have such experts here today. Um, I'll quickly introduce them. So um, right next to me is David Cohen, who's um, chief executive of the um, IAB, um, absolute expert in all things CMO, marketing and advertising, based in New York. Um, then we have Carol Chen, global CMO and SVP for global mobility marketing at Shell. Um, and then at the end, we have Tim Vanderhoek, CEO and co-founder and chairman of Viant. So guys, thank you so much for being here. You are absolutely the right people to have on this stage. Um, uh, and so, Tim, just coming back to my point on the huge um, evolution of this industry towards tech, um, can you catch us up on where we are? We're talking about AI, we're talking about a cookie-less world. Can you, you've called this a renaissance in advertising. Can you just give us a sense of where we are and catch us up on the two years since we've been out? Yeah, I think where we all started was third-party cookies gave us the ability to target effectively and personalize the advertising on the front end, and more importantly, measure what the return on investment was from that advertising investment from a measurement perspective. And I think where if you fast forward and third-party cookies evaporating, it's important not to call it cookie-less. We're losing third-party cookies. But the website owner, first-party data, has entered the fray now as kind of the way forward. And I think when, when I think of where we are today, the personalization on the front end, publishers still have the ability to drop a cookie. They understand the consumer data. They're requiring more and more registration of their users uh, to actually access their content. So the personalization of ad targeting is still there. But I think what's still missing is measurement. It's that ability of what the third party cookie did, which showed an ad on the Wall Street Journal's website and later came to the advertiser's website and purchased. That's what's broken today. And I think so what the problem we're all trying to solve for really is measurement from a marketing. What is the return on investment without a third party cookie? And that's where artificial intelligence, this new form of first party data being blended together in, in, the, in the clouds, uh, as we call it, uh, being able to tie ad exposure to measurement in the cloud. And, and how do we do that? It's all about people based data. So if you think of the, the old world, it was you had a CRM system where your customer file lived. And now that, that is gonna become the measurement platform. As your point of sale or CRM system acquires new customers, you know their name, address, phone number, email, one of those data points are associated that you have, and you're gonna match that up to first party publisher data, all in the cloud, all privacy friendly, and it's more accurate. So just catching up, I think where we're at is, ad personalization went through a change, but we've kinda solved that working with publishers who still have cookies and the ability to do it, but measurement is that big question for marketers in their mind, and it's the ability to tie your people-based data or customer data to the publishers that you're working with uh, in the cloud. And I think we'll be able to recreate where we were. And it's a renaissance because this is why. Cookies only measured e-commerce transactions. And for any marketer, we know e-commerce is some percentage of our sales. But most marketers have a big physical retail footprint and when you get away from the third party cookie world and you get into real people based data dealing with the CRM, we're now able not just not just able to measure e-commerce transactions, but we're able to measure in store purchases as well. And that's why I say it's a renaissance. We used to love all that digital did, that it was data driven. Now in this new approach, we're able to apply it across all the totality of the revenue of the marketer, not just the e-commerce slice. Um, and Carol. As a CMO, you are absolutely walking the walk here. And you're a huge advocate of, of reinvention being a prerequisite for good marketing. Can you tell us how this is showing up in your world and how you're harnessing a lot of what Tim's just told us about in your day-to-day -day work? 
No, absolutely. So, uh, so just a little bit context. So I'm the CMO for our retail business at Shell. So we have 47,000 size. Every day, roughly about 30 million customers to our size. So the way we have been really thinking and doing and experimenting would be that if you step back and think about what the customer need, they need to say, I need these at this time that meets my journey. Um, and, and, and really that the way we're thinking about job is that how do we really put the right message to the right customer at the right time with the right offer to drive the right experience? Ultimately, it's really that how AI and data can enable that experience. And by return, if we're doing correctly, then it will give you the ROI. So the way we're looking at that is really exactly as team said would be that if you think about the customer touch points, there's a lot about advertising. There's a lot about loyalty and CRM. There's also a lot about in-store. So essentially, AI is to allow you to really tie the, tie the knots all together to say, how do I use AI? So if I am driving uh, a BMW in a hot day attending an event, what do I need versus if I am a trucker in a cold winter, uh, I'm hungry and it's freezing cold, I'm stopping by you, what I need. They have very different needs. Uh, and AI essentially is a, is a way that allow you to really deliver the right thing for the customer at the right point. The other thing I also want to tie back would be our eye. Because if I think about my job, I have two jobs uh, which integrate it. One is that how do I make it right for the customer? But at the same time, how do I show the ROI for the company? Because ultimately, if I can show the ROI, then there's a more support or more needs or more way I can do So that's why that the whole AI-enabled ROI in, uh, kind of system will actually allow me to find a way to drive value both for the customer and for the company. And then you really get into the very positive uh, uh, journey. So that's how, that's how the journey we started, but it's also, in my view, I look at the whole cookie's world not as a threat. I genuinely look at it as a huge opportunity for the marketers and CMOs uh, to step up their job and really to say, how do I make it happen? So that's how we're, we're thinking about that. So I want to come back to the ROI and how you actually make this happen, what skill sets happened, um, <coughs> it needs to be built, and sort of a little bit of backstory of that in a little bit of, uh, a little bit of time. But um, David, yes, brave sir. new world out there. So um, obviously everyone's ready for this, right? And everyone's had time to prepare. How is the market set up in terms of readiness to adopt this renaissance in advertising? Yes. Um, so we've been doing some research uh, that we call the state of data research. We've done it about four or five years, and it's exactly that. Our, our goal was to determine how ready is the market for the impending changes. Uh, it's really a tale of two cities. If I look at the latest data that we released earlier this year, um, if you ask the marketing community, uh, senior marketing executives, a agency executives, are you prepared for the impending changes to third party identifiers, privacy, regulations, etc.? Fully 75% of people say, yes, I am prepared. If you double click on that, uh, are you investing in AI? Are you investing in first party? Are you changing your measurement strategies? Uh, fully 75% of them are doing none of that either. So <laughs> clearly, uh, there's what I'm saying I'm doing and what I'm actually doing. Yeah. Uh, there's no way in God's green earth that you could be prepared for the changes if you are not investing in some of those things. People are still investing in third party data. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why, but so it's really a tale of two cities. Yeah. cities. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to urge the market to move now as opposed to cramming for the exam right before the day before, because uh, that's not going to be good. But everybody knew this was coming, right? So what is, what's the impediment <coughs> here? I mean, not, not to be a cynical agency or, or advertising executive, but uh, we don't change as an industry until we have to. Right. Right? I mean, uh, GDPR is a good example. When I was on the agency side of the business, GDPR was coming, GDPR was coming, GDPR was coming, and then it came, and we're like, oh my god, what do we need to do to <laughs> yeah. get our clients prepared for GDPR? and then you scramble. Uh, right. And that is a similar thing to, uh, to what we're doing here. I think that there's, there's a lot of entrenched behaviors. People don't want to change. It's easier to not change. There is some I hear in my purview that say that, oh, we're not going to do away with third-party cookies. It's just a, it's a facade. It's never going to go away. It's never going to change. So um, we're urging people to, uh, to kick it into gear I bet. and get into action. I bet. Tim, let me ask you the same question. 
Because you must have a lot of these conversations with clients. I guess by the time you're talking, they're kind of quite a long way down that road. But where do you see the resistance in the market? Is it, is it about the marketing function per se? Are those the right people to be talking to? Give us your perspective. I think it's a lack of understanding of artificial intelligence. It's a lack of understanding of available technologies uh, that are out there. I mean, when we say the word AI, I think most people don't know what, that, what it is, yeah. what it does. And just to give a practical application of artificial intelligence, if you have an, we do it on email addresses. So let's say you acquire first party data, you get an email, you don't know their gender, their age, their income, you, don't, you know nothing about it, it's just an email. And so the way we use AI internally on the first party data as well is you'll have an email address, let's say alex at gmail.com. The AI can calculate the probability of gender just off of the name ingesting and being trained off of other names in that region with gender associated. And if you add one letter to that Alex, which is gonna be a 90 some percent probability of a male, if you add one letter, the letter A to Alex at the end, and it becomes Alexa at gmail.com, the probability shifts the other way back to gender. And so I think it's just more and more, we need more examples of how artificial intelligence delivers value that are tangible, practical, and real. So you get a better understanding. I think right now you see the two words, most people are scared of it because they that's something that it's a brave new world where you have to go learn yourself and most people don't like to continue learning they like status quo and the way things are so i just think with all things comfort comes with knowledge and better understanding of the technologies that are out there but i say it every day till i'm blue in the face and and the statistics come back just like david said mm -hmm. is we'll change when we need to change uh, but i don't I, I do think that change is here today when I look in the bid stream, we're a DSP, so when I look in the bid stream at all available ad opportunities, the statistics today are one out of four ad impressions has a cookie attached to it. And where is that? That's Google Chrome, right? That's the remaining place where a cookie works, but it's a big web browser. So <coughs> with one out of four, only 75% of ad opportunities being uh, uh, addressable with a cookie, the time is now, but that data, I think, is being hidden by a lot of vendors in the supply chain. So picking up on something you said there, it has to be tangible, actual, and real. Carol, you're working in a sector that is big energy, rapidly trying to decarbonize and put its best foot forward in a marketing sense, which is challenging, right? How, do you, how does this data-led approach help you achieve that tangible, real value? Yeah, no, it's a great question, right? If, you, if I give a couple of examples, for example, one example that we all know in the mobility sector one big transformation for decarbonization is going to be electric vehicle. But if you really look at electric vehicle drivers, um, the key moment of truth is not after they buy the car, it's actually before they're even thinking about their buying the car. And because that's how a lot of anxiety and frustration and unknown kicks in. So one of the, 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 the key things we're working on to say that we know that people need a lot of reassurance in terms of charging infrastructure. And how do we use AI to, even you're just thinking about that, how do I play a role to really able to serve you uh, the right infrastructure, which we know that we enable that acceleration. Another example we're working on is in our B2B uh, world that we know that every single CEO on the planet right now all have uh, a carbon neutral target by some point. If you interview every single CEO, nobody have a really credible path. So the other one we're looking at to say that if you think about my ambition and where you are, and if you look at the stakeholder along the journey, you have chief sustainability officer, you have chief finance officer, you have chief operation officer, but then it's really that how do you also able to line up with each and single one of them, what they're looking for, what's the solution, and how shell solution can be able to enable and address the challenge and the question, but enable them to make an informed decision. So that's why that I think that um, we're quite excited about the AI world because uh, it really opened up. Again, if I think about the chief sustainability officer, what they care, it's very different from a chief operation man, uh, officer. Mm. So how do you really, again, going back, really use AI to serve uh, the right content, the right message, and depends on how they react, you're able to really then close the loop. Uh, yeah. and, and it just opened up so much opportunities. So. And how are you thinking about ROI in that environment? Yeah. Is it, has it made it more 
demonstrable, e e more easily demonstrated? Yes, so uh, we actually building, uh, so one of the advantage we have being a retailer is that we have buy store, buy SKU, buy minute, buy customer post data. So one of the project that uh, I'm actually asking to, to work on, which AI will play a huge role, would be that build me an ROI model to really, going back to, I don't have all the answer. I don't know what works. Uh, but if you think about the whole answer is about how do you constantly use the whole agile marketing, AI enabled, to really uh, try, experiment, predict, adjust. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that will unlock huge opportunities. So we're building confidentially or unconfidentially uh, AI-driven machine learning ROI model. And once that's in place, uh, the odds of possibility, technology become enabler, but your creativity and imagination become an accelerator. So able to merge the two, ultimately the data doesn't lie and the customer doesn't lie. And, and that's how that I think that how I play a critical role. It's not just about what I like, what you like. It's ultimately like what customer decide to pay and buy. And are you really take all the way to the bottom line? Okay, I'm yeah. gonna come to you in a second, David, on this. But Tim, when you're having that ROI conversation with your clients, what can you what what can you tell them about how the investments now can pay off in the future? What does that future ROI look like? Yeah, I view advertising as the shift right now from it used to be here's a budget for media investment and we're going to go use this to educate consumers. And I think <coughs> the smartest companies have switched that model away from an investment upfront and more into the cost of goods sold of the P&L. And that's where advertising is not a budget that you receive from the CEO and go spend and we hope for the best. That's the old way. The new way, it's a customer acquisition cost. It's an ongoing customer cost as a, another touch point in the journey. And so what I say is get away from I invested 10 million, 100 million, 50 million in this project. What were the returns? And put it into the line item of the, of the P&L as a cost of goods sold. And as an industry, if we get there, because that's the real purpose why we're all here, is you have to distribute the product or service that you offer directly to consumers. That's today's world. And so to do that, distribution is a line item uh, in the actual P&L as a cost of goods sold to distribute the end, the end product to the end user. And th every conversation I have is, you've got to change the old 100-year-old model of let's spend this much in media and then hope it works. It's like, no, you're going to spend this much in media upfront let the model tell you, is, am I receiving a profit or am I spending too much to distribute the product or service? Once that model is correct, your ad budget is actually unlimited because it's a cost of goods sold to distribute the product and consumers are going to drive demand for that product or service in the long run. And I think that's the biggest conversation we have to have as an industry is it's not advertising. It's direct to consumer distribution and there's a cost associated with that and we push those messages to consumers using ad tech. So, David, if marketers get this right, that makes the whole marketing narrative much easier with inside the organization, right? You're going to go and ask your CFO for some budget. Yep. You, sh you can demonstrate absolute ROI on that investment. Is it going to make the whole, is it going to change the whole picture? Well, as you were, as you were talking, Tim, one of the things that came to mind is if you look at 100% uh, of effort uh, in the kind of go-to-market approach, it typically was, let's say, 40% is on uh, insight development planning, 40% was on um, execution, and then 20% was on optimization and figuring out what works. That's entirely flipped on its head. We need to spend far less time uh, on the upfront part and let the market decide what's working and what isn't working. So think about things in uh, modular ways, uh, optimized for what the market determines what works and what doesn't. The data is so rich today mm -hmm. to determine uh, what's making the cash register ring and what isn't. Data doesn't lie. That's a tweetable moment that I'm going to use yeah. for the future. Um, but yeah, I think it's a lot easier. It's just turned entirely on its head. What about the function of marketing? That seems like it might go far beyond the CMO now, right? And while the CMO obviously plays a pivotal role, you need the chief data officer in that conversation. You need to get your chief analytics officer. It's the chief customer officer, I think. Yeah, it's, it's about customer experience. It's about insights. It's about understanding uh, the journey. It's yeah. not just about uh, understanding messaging and channel. That's yeah. kind of what marketing used to be. It's far beyond that, which I think is why CMOs are actually becoming much more closer to the sun, closer to the CEO, as you become the, the master understander of what customers want, yeah. uh, I think it's just 
even more important, but we have yeah. a CMO sitting next to Can I build on that? Uh, so uh, recently, that uh, uh, I went to our executive committee uh, to talk about customer-backed digital enabled. How can customer-backed digital <coughs> enabled to really help Shell to accelerate energy transition? So the conversation with EC will be exactly as we'll talk about that. The future of energy transition, ultimately, the customer will decide uh, what they buy, what price they're willing to pay. Are they happy? They're not happy. But we can do, and they're not, again, it's not marketing alone. Right? So we actually brought our chief uh, uh, technology officer, chief digital officer, chief finance officer to say, what we can do is really that use data, use technology to enable that customer journey. Uh, and how do we create, we call that single customer view. How do we create customer data hub? How you will use technology, AI machine learning to enable that customer experience. And then if you do it right, what are the financial implications? So that's why that exactly that, that, I mean, I don't see my role just as uh, producing that beautiful advertising. <laughs> that's not my role. I generally see my role, as I mentioned earlier, be how do I really create value for the customer that they're happy? How do I create value to the bottom line so my company is happy? Yeah. And these two agenda has to be one integrated agenda. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's absolutely significant, elevated. And I see in a lot of um, senior CMO uh, community, mm. one of the questions that the CMO community is asking um, ourselves and themselves would be that, is CMO losing a seat in the boardroom? And that's a lot of senior marketer uh, CMO is asking. Yeah. And my view would be that if you can really figure it out, the customer agenda and the profitability agenda, you would be absolutely one of the essential person in the boardroom <coughs> together with the CEO and the CFO. How interesting. Is there a genuine yeah. fear around that point, do you think? Yes. By those who just can't keep up on it and, and Correct. Adapt. Yeah. That's why we're promoting all CMOs to the chief growth officer. Yeah. <laughs> or chief customer officer. Yeah. 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 Well, well yeah. Tim, let's get your view on that, that chief customer officer. Like, who do you pitch to when, when, you're, when you're talking to these organizations? They don't really exist today. Uh, most of the time you're talking to marketing, but the marketing skill set has to have more of a technology background as well to understand and, and the application <laughs> of it. So a lot of times we get brought in, when we get brought in, of course, it starts with the marketing team. It's someone senior there but then it extends into the technology team and very quickly you're talking to the legal team around data privacy and protection in there. And so I think it's hard because there's many different individual groups that have to weigh in and because it's brand new, not there isn't an industry standard approved way forward yet and everyone's very nervous as privacy laws continue to change and fracture. It used to be one global internet and we would get on it and everybody had a ride. And now there's a fractured internet and each country is creating its own internet with its own privacy laws and its own way forward. And that's created yet another layering challenge to the way forward. Right, that, that creates a hyper complex environment, yep. doesn't it? Yep. Yes. How, how did, tell, uh, David, let's just pick up on that complex environment. How do people get their heads around that? Well, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons that the IAB and other organizations like us exist. So to navigate um, regulatory environment in the U.S. is complicated, getting more complicated. Uh, you have this balkanized kind of view, Europe kind of carving off its own Internet, Russia carving off its own Internet. Um, you have five states in the U.S. carving off their own Internet. So um, we're advocating in Washington and in uh, Brussels for kind of comprehensive privacy reform so that we don't have all these kind of different views on the world. Yeah. Um, it's, it's complicated. There's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You try to think about a lowest common denominator, very hard to do that. Um, there is no doubt that advertising uh, globally is under threat. Um, there are a lot of folks that are looking to punish big successful technology companies and in the process mm -hmm. will punish a whole bunch of kind of mid-size and small-size uh, companies. So it's a, there's, it's a challenging environment. There's yeah. no simple fix. Is but there they, but they still need to be punished. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I agree. Not the little small ones or the mid-size ones, but the big tech companies, they're kind of the reason why we're here. Everyone, they've created the problems. Yeah. Apple has created the problem. And I think we need to move our opinion towards these big tech companies from where you have plausible deniability if, let's say, Apple's ATT changes and IDFA deletion. I find it amazing that it's destroyed the revenue of small, mid-sized tech companies, yet it's driven a 250% increase in their own revenue through the yeah. App Store search ads. 
and they take plausible deniability. Oh, these two things were totally not tied. As an industry and a government body, I would encourage all of them that it's now culpability. If it happens, it was by design, and that's the way we should approach big tech because their power is unchecked. And I think that's the biggest, uh, I guess, unknown thing is that everybody knows it, but no one knows how to put their finger on it. And I think what we have to get away from, you're no longer allowed to have deniability, you're culpable if you have that power and it does reverberate in such a negative way. Yeah, I mean, just to build on that quickly, the reason why we exist is to create open standards that could, the industry can use, uh, not proprietary advantage that kind of, uh, which, and the, the emphasis unfortunately seems to be on the walled gardens, the proprietary advantage, as opposed to this interoperable uh, world, but we're gonna keep doing uh, what we could do to kind of uh, break down those walls and make interoperability a thing. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to come to questions. I've I got a couple more before I do that. Okay. How should we be thinking? This is a festival of creativity, right? We've all talked about it there, about how it's, there's such a focus <coughs> on tech. How should we be thinking about creativity when we're also thinking about AI and the technology that we can overlay on, on all of this? David, why don't you start us off? Um, I, I remember I've been coming to Cannes for probably, I don't know, 15 plus years and I remember uh, in the early days uh, as a media guy coming to Cannes in the kind of elite creative uh, world it was an entirely different uh, environment now if you look at Cannes it is data and technology driven creativity uh, and I think that those two things are inexorably linked mm -hmm. how do you use data to inform uh, storytelling in the best possible way how do you think about uh, optimization, how do you think about measurement in a different way? Um, so I, th I think that those two things are, if you just look at kind of yacht row, uh, there's a, a whole lot of uh, technology and data totally. companies that are infusing uh, creativity and I think that's the, that's the new name of the game. Okay, how do you think about it, um, Carol, in your approach to reaching that consumer? Yeah, so very similarly that we, we think creativity, data and tech as integrated way, uh, ultimately that you you cannot and you should not only let AI do the work. Creativity actually play a huge role in terms of moving the needle and the connection with the customer. And then also that when you blend three, we actually experimented many different things that your ROI go up exponentially because you're able to really tailor that personalization message to me, not to everyone. So I think that the, I think the, the beauty and the magic is really how do you make the three work together. Yeah, yeah. sounds like it puts more onus on the creative yeah. actually. Absolutely, than, yeah. yeah, okay. But there is no better return on investment than when you have the right ad to the right user at the right time yeah. and messaging plays a key role in that, which is why artificial intelligence is so critical to deliver the correct message to that end consumer on what their needs are at that moment. Yeah. Okay, so skill sets, just quickly for each of you, we've talked about like what that requires at the C-suite level, but when you're building out a marketing function, what are the skill sets you need to be looking at? Carol, why don't you So number one, exactly what we talk about, that how your ability to really <coughs> blend <coughs> together creativity, data, and tech. Uh, modern marketers, that if you can't really figure out way among the three, then you'll be in big trouble. Second is, uh, uh, we talked a little bit earlier, that the ability and the appetite for agile, constant testimony, because the machine can tell you what you serve the machine and then predict. Uh, but then, so the ability about is not about my marketing plan is going to sit for 12 months, constantly bombard the model with different hypotheses, test, learn, and then scale. I think that would be absolutely critical. And the last one would be performance, uh, because ultimately, the number never lie. If you're able to do to take everything and draw all the way to the bottom line, our eye, that's how you unlock magic. So those are the three. I would just add broadly data science. Uh, I mean, if you want to turn your marketing organization into a high powered organization, add data science members to your team and watch how much smarter you are very quickly. It levels you up tremendously. And I think marketing has always shied away from that skill set. And I think that's the necessary skill set to understand what's going on. It doesn't mean you have to know, it means someone on your team has to be able to translate for you and know. And that's the, that's the primary goal. So I think if you add data science or even third parties, it doesn't necessarily need to be in-house. I bet one of the biggest <coughs> categories in the future is data science as a service offered to businesses because it's a very hard skill set to go at, attract and retain the talents yeah. because these mm. individuals are wanted 
everywhere in yeah. every organization. Yeah, there will yeah. be a squeeze on yeah. the talents. Carol, that's what you need to tell the CMOs when you... So it's, uh, it's interesting you mentioned that. So in my team, uh, I have a team of data analytics and data privacy. Uh, we actually have about 50 data scientists sitting in different locations. And the reason why, particularly what you mentioned, would be nowadays the role of CMO is not just about creativity. It's really about how you're able to integrate the data, the, the, the model, and to unlock the creativity. So uh, I would strongly advocate that for every CMO, if that's a possibility. How does that figure with your members, do you think? Uh, yeah, not to tread on very, very good answers already or just be duplicative. I think that if I were to think about the single greatest challenge we have as an industry, it is talent and the talent crisis that we're all facing. Um, we have been a victim of our own success. We have had 25 years in the digital space of double digit year on year growth and we simply do not have the people coming into the business to do the business. Uh, so it's incumbent upon all of us to inspire the next generation of talent to want to get into this world that we've chosen to be in. Um, and we're trying to do our job. We, do a, we have a, an apprenticeship program. We're trying to bring people in um, that might not have considered marketing or media or technology or data as a career to show them what's possible. We invite them to our events. We invite them to our um, to try to inspire them because mm -hmm. I think we need a we need a, a, a groundswell of folks to say yes I want to be part of that uh, Otherwise, we're going to be in a uh, in a real hurt locker. I think mm -hmm. for a while Yeah, that being said the internet is the most exciting industry that you could possibly think to be associated with and I think No one when we have interns that come in and mm -hmm. nobody says oh, this was a bad experience no. I didn't learn anything right. their mind is blown on what happens behind the scenes on the <coughs> internet and it's just the introduction more and more to younger audiences that hey this is probably the future of where the rest of the world's going so you should put your uh, mind share in this direction and start to see which areas you fit in yeah and also with that uh, just to add one thing that is actually a uh, super uh, exciting and motivating to the team uh, when you tell them I don't have the answer but this is a business problem mm -hmm you will go away with a small team of data scientists, creativity, how do you guys solve that? And, and I found that that's extremely motivating uh, actually to the talent because they felt that suddenly they can really figure out something magical. Mm. The management probably don't have the answer. Yeah. Questions, guys, make the most of these experts here, right at the back here. Uh, Zach from Tenable Vets. Uh, Carol, I'm gonna start with you with this question. But obviously we got a mic oh, here. Sorry, you yeah. can't, can everyone hear me anyway? Use the mic. Uh, sure. So uh, my question starts with, in your experience, what have been the limitations with AI in your marketing? Yeah, so I think the, uh, so we, we had a little chat uh, before, before the section. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think that uh, if I'm being really honest, uh, not everyone in the organization truly understand what really is AI. What can be the power of AI? Is that just a black box? Am I going to do what the machine tell me to do? So I actually think that uh, you have different um, maturity, depends on different parts of organization. And I think that for this to truly unlock the value, like I work in a global business, uh, we're in 80, 80 markets. How do you really unlock that? I don't know what it is. I don't want to do it. I want, I, I mean, I have years of experience. It's really, I also think about how do we bring people along the journey um, not everybody grew up in the AI age, and then there's a different understanding, different adoption, but then if you think about change, you ultimately need the whole organization, either as a global, regional, local, to be able to really integrate and drive that together. So I think that, that I still think that's a huge job to be done. I would add to that, I think one of the biggest challenges, so let's, we're talking about first party data, changes in cookies, third party cookies going away. Yet if you're a publisher or an advertiser, you're still using a third party ad server to deliver the ads if you're an advertiser. If you're a publisher, you're using DoubleClick to deliver your ads to consumers. None of that data even comes to your organization. You're outsourcing everything to Google. And I think it's waking up and recognizing, oh wow, I have to change my whole tech stack going forward from the DSP I use to the ad server I use to the SSP I use. There's a third party ad tech apocalypse. That's what happened, it's not cookies. It's all pixels, ad serving tags, everything is gonna be deleted and you have to replace it with first party technology. So I think the biggest challenge is when I tell someone, yeah, but you're just using double click to serve your ads if you're a publisher or an advertiser, it just goes into the O oh moment in their head of I, I have to really rip all of it out. And it's so daunting, I think a lot of people are in between where 
maybe I'm going to retire in a year and I don't want to go through that. Or yes. that seems like a big amount of work. And then so status quo continues to stay the same. And so again, I get on, if you're not, if you're outsourcing everything to Google, don't expect to advance and expect to lose because they're going to take their fees and they're going to take the data and you're not going to extract the value that your competitor is, both if you're a publisher or a marketer. It doesn't matter on either side. And so I think it's the recognition that you've got to make changes in the technology stack that you were using from 20 years ago or 15 years ago or 10 years ago. The earth has rotated. The world has changed. There are new privacy regulations. And you've got to replace all third-party technology with new first-party technology. Tim, has anyone yes. done, a, done a calculation of how much that's going to cost? Mm. It's actually not hard, and it doesn't cost a lot. Uh, I mean, it's already there. It, are organizations in the cloud? Absolutely. Uh, they just, there's these old habits that die hard, which is like, think of the ad server. I, I do it because it's an easy one to pick on, but it's a third-party ad server, yet it's installed on 99% of properties. If we crawled the web and looked, is DoubleClick active or not? So I think it's this recognition and then getting away from picking a technology because of the brand of the organization. And I think that's where a lot of false premises come out. Anyone can sell you vaporware, and big companies sell you vaporware too. So I think you've got to really invest in your own technologies under your own stack and bet on yourself that you believe in what you're doing and that it's going to work. Most people just, they don't bet on themselves. They have that fear that they're making a wrong decision, and yet they outsource to Google. You're nodding a lot. So let's, let's beat this question to death. I'm going to do one more thing, one add-on. Um, we as humans are imperfect. Uh, we are imperfect. We have biases. Uh, we have biases, some are intended, some are unintended. Those biases translate into uh, AI. So one of the things that we are focused on at the IAB is to understand bias in AI and how do we counteract mm -hmm. that, uh, because that's not helpful uh, as we're trying to use uh, machine learning and AI to make uh, business decisions. So. Time for one more question, super quick. Hi there, I I'm Michelle G, and I'm the CEO of Ebony and Jet Magazine. And I have a really valuable audience, right? I'm a really small company. Uh, we bought the company out of bankruptcy and re you know, relaunching that. So if you're me, uh, I know that I need to collect data. How would you, like what am I doing in the next 12 months? Uh, sorry, I just had to ask this question. Oh, uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> You know, because I'm building, so I have an opportunity to build in technology to capture this data, which all my advertisers say they need from me. Mm -hmm. So what, what's next? Um, I, I can answer. I think you, you need an agency. From a, from a <laughs> hey, listen, that too, right? What do you yeah. start out at? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, when I look at it over time, Building a following on Facebook, how did all those likes turn out for all that investment that chased a cost per like? It, you know, Building on other people's platforms doesn't create value over the long term. You have to have your own direct touch point with consumers where they know to come back to access you. So to me, it's all about building everything on your own platforms, your own website, your own mobile app. And what does first party data look like? First party data looks like IP addresses. It is part of it. And then depending on the country that you're at, as the website owner, you still have it. DoubleClick doesn't have it, but as the website owner, you have it. Um, capturing email addresses um, from there, and then being able to reach consumers in the destination that they're at. And I would say, you know, long term, what is the most valuable data? It's going to be uh, driving and reinforcing where the consumer can find your content, whether it's a mobile app, if it's magazine content or whatever it may be, or a website destination. It's just understanding and beating it in that here's where it's at because they will refresh the data for you once they get there. So um, yeah, I mean, it's the biggest thing right now is first party data um, and being able to put it all together. And then from there, you'll be able to find new audiences that look just like your current audience. Can I just add two things? Uh, one would be that I think one question would be really to answer would be what do you need this data for? So what is the outcome or the user case or the value you want to create? Because that answer will allow you to figure out what kind of data you would need. So be very clear about what you need this data for. The second thing is really also think about value exchange. Because nowadays, especially with data privacy, consumers are also very um, cautious about what they give and not give. And, and, and third, third part, first party data will be absolutely crucial. But you also need to think about why does the consumer want to give you that data? 
what is value exchange? What are you adding value to them? So if you're clear about the outcome, you're clear about the value exchange, then you will be able to, technology nowadays uh, is not the barrier. Technology is actually probably the easy part uh, if you find the right partner, but really be very intentional and be very clear uh, with that. I think that would be very crucial. That user experience is the hardest part. Yeah. Excellent. Um, we are actually completely out of time. Um, <laughs> But can you guys stick around for five minutes if there are sure. more questions yeah. sure. here from yes. the audience? Thank you so much yeah. for joining Thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Carol, David, fantastic conversation. Thank you.